السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. نحمده ونسلم على رسول النبي الكريم عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا صلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله Last week we started talking about the conversation between Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullah who is the main Khalifa of Janad Baghdadi uh, and his student who had come back from Hajj. And we got to the point where we're talking about Maqam Ibrahim and actually the last two questions I kind of rushed through because of time. So we'll go back to the question before that which was the question about Hajjir Aswad, you know, the black stone. So just some history on the black stone and before I continue. You know, this was a stone that was sent down from the heavens. You know, a lot of non-Muslims would say, oh, it's a meteor, which by definition is correct. You know, a meteor is something not from this world. You know, it came from outside, so by definition, yeah. You know, but this came from paradise. Allah SWT sent it down. And Ibrahim al -Islam placed it. You know, this is the the one stone of the Kaaba that cannot be replaced. All the other stones could be replaced. You know, if something happened, they could replace those stones. This is one stone that cannot be replaced. You know, Hajir Aswad is Hajir Aswad. It marks the beginning of the Tawaf. So it marks the beginning point and the ending point of the Tawaf. Uh, and during the time of Rasulullah you know, when Quraysh were rebuilding the Kaaba. So this was before the declaration of prophethood. And the dispute arose as to who would have the honor, which clan would have the honor to place the black stone in its position. And they were about to go to war when one of them suggested that, well, why don't we just let whoever comes into the Kaaba, the first, the first person to come in uh, into the Haram or into the Masjid tomorrow, morning, he will decide. And they agreed upon that. And of course, you know, the first person to come is none other than Rasulullah. <laughs> An interesting thing is that when this happened, when he came in, you know, all of them were very overjoyed. Because again, he's the one that they refer to as Sadiq al Amin, the truthful and the trustworthy. Now, even though these are, the, these are the same people who are going to violently, viciously, vehemently oppose him when he declares his prophethood. But these are the, also the same people who said that he's never lied. There's no one more trustworthy than him. If he says something, it's true. And he doesn't do or say anything without meaning. They all agreed on these things. So when they see him come in, they also know that he is the most just among them. And in reality, the most just among creation. He is the definition of justice. The, justness, the definition of purity. The definition of truth. So when he comes in, they're all overjoyed. Ah, you know, because they say whatever decision he makes, is going to be fair and just. So he tells them, Know, bring a sheep. They bring the sheep, says lay it down, they lay it down, he picks up the black stone, places it in the middle of the sheep. And then he tells each one of them, pick up, you know, each clan, a representative from each clan will pick up one of the corners or the corners. So the various clans, each one's touching a corner of the sheet. They lift it up, bring it to its spot, and then he himself picks it up, kisses it, and places it where it should be. 
which is also a symbolism that he is the final stone in the house of messengers, in the house of the prophets. And the only stone that cannot be replaced again. And so when the Sheikh he asked the question, he said, did you place your hands upon the black stone and kiss it? And the student said, yes. He says, you know, he lets out this sigh and he says, woe unto you. Rasulullah has said that whoever touches the black stone is as if one who has shaken hands with Allah. And whoever shakes the hand of Allah, he is safe from everything. He says, and did you feel anything of that security? When you did this, did you feel any of this security? He said, no. He said, then you did not place your hands on the black stone. I mean, when we ponder into what he's asking, you know, you think about it. What does it mean to shake a hand? You know, we, we talk about, we, we mention this every day or some of us, but we never think about it. You know, you make a deal with somebody, and what do you do? You shake their hands. And then if they go back on their word, you say, we shook hands. I mean, that seals the deal. So to come and kiss the black stone, to place your hands on the black stone is making a deal with Allah. You are, in, you are literally making a deal with Allah. When we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, so we have made a deal with Allah. <coughs> and of course the Hajj is the pinnacle of, of faith. So this is, this is, you know, sealing that deal. So what is the deal? You know, this is why Ali Radim, he said, don't say like this when he said, I'm, you know, oh, black stone, you are only a stone, and if I had not seen Rasulullah Sallam kissing you, I'd never kissed you. Ali Radio was standing behind him, he said, oh, Omar, don't say like this, because Rasulullah Sallam has said that on the day of judgment, this stone will testify to the faith of, of those who come before it with faith, to the iman of those who come before it with iman, and the disbelief of those who come before it with disbelief. Those who place their hands on it and don't and don't fulfill the deal. Because when we say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, says, we have sold ourselves. We have submitted completely to our Lord in accordance with the Rasulullah. We have promised to honor and, and respect the messenger. And not only to honor and respect him, but to defend the honor as well. And now if we make that deal and we go back on our word, somebody violates a contract, what happens? You go to court. If it's a major contract, you know, if it's a petty contract, you say, ah, let it go. It's not worth haggling over. But if it's a major contract, what are you going to do? You're going to end up in court. And the judge has to decide. The interesting thing here is, the court, this is the most significant of contracts. The most important contract. You know, the contract with our Lord. And if we violate that contract, then where do we end up? We end up in court. Who's the judge in that court? other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what that shaykh is asking, Abu Bakr Shibli Rahmatullah is asking his student. So when you touch the black stone, did you feel that? Did you notice that? Did you, did you really have that in your heart? Were you willing, you know, when you, when you shook hands on that contract, are you willing to do everything that it takes to fulfill that contract? You know, we could go on about this, you know, for a long time, but you know, I think everybody gets the gist. Uh, 
Again, these are things to ponder over. So the next question was, did you make two rakat salat in Maqam Ibrahim? And the student said yes. So he said, you know, we went over what Maqam Ibrahim is, that stone, which Ibrahim al-Islam used to stand on, and it knew where he needed to be. Why? Because of that transfer of that knowledge of the unseen to the inanimate things. So when you did that, Allah SWT had placed you at a very elevated position and status. Did you do what is required of that position and status? And the student said, no, I didn't do anything. He said, well, you didn't make two rakat in maqam. So again, if we look at the maqam, you know, maqam, again, you know, the physical sense is that stone, but maqam in reality is the, is the uh, status and position and the honor of Ibrahim al -Islam. So when he's being thrown into the fire and the angel Jabil comes and says, oh, I'm here to help you. He says what? He says, did Allah send you? He said, no, I came with his permission, but he didn't send me. He didn't order me to come. He said, I don't need your help. He says, just tell me this much. Is Allah looking upon me? Which, of course, means is he looking upon me with his pleasure? Is he pleased with me? Because otherwise he's looking upon everything. And when Jibreel Islam says, yes, he said, I don't need anything else. I am pleased with the pleasure of Allah. If it pleases him for me to be thrown into the fire, it pleases me to be thrown into the fire. He doesn't make any of the, oh, Allah, save me from this. Change this condition. Nothing. Of course, people, you know, as I mentioned, they used this incident in the wrong way. And when we went for Hajj in 2003, you know, in the women's section, the woman was giving a talk. My wife was there, and she, she was listening, and the woman was mentioning this incident. So, see, you should only ask from Allah. That's what, oh, you know, if you go and ask from the only Allah, oh, that's shirk and bidah, you only ask from Allah. So I told my wife, I said, you should have asked her, what did Ibrahim al Islam ask from Allah at that time? He didn't ask anything. He is teaching us to be pleased with the pleasure of Allah. Which is also interesting, you know. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the, this position of being pleased with the pleasure of Allah is a very high status. We can attain Jannah even with lower status. You know, we can attain Jannah simply by doing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. Whether it pleases us or not. We simply do it. But for his beloved, Allah SWT has set a different criteria as far as the attitude toward the beloved. The attitude toward Allah is, okay, I'm fulfilling the command. And I got to get up at Fajr. I, you know, it's hard on me. I don't like to get up at Fajr, but I still get up at Fajr. Allah SWT says, fine. You're pleased with it, not pleased with it, just do it. But the attitude towards the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala defines for us in Surah Nisa, Surah Number Four, Verse Sixty-Five. You know, in the verse, you know, just the beautiful words that it starts off with, "Fala wa Rabbika." Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "No." He says, "By no one else, other than I." Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "I swear by no one else other than your Lord, O my beloved." You know, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is swearing by Himself, but not. He's not swearing by himself by saying, I swear by my honor or by my majesty or by myself. He says, I swear by your Lord, O my beloved. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. None of them is a believer. Unless he makes you a judge in all of his affairs. Not only does he make you a judge in all of his affairs, but also there is no hesitation in what you decide for him. Whatever you decide for him, He's 
satisfied with. وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا And he accepts it wholeheartedly, completely. Meaning he loves what you have decided for him. So when it comes to Rasulullah that says that you're not even a believer. Unless you will love what, what my beloved has decided for you. Again, you know, each one of these points we could go on for a long time, but time is short. People's attention spans are shorter. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, the purpose here isn't to give everybody every little detail. You know, kind of hit the important points and let people think and ponder, which we don't do, unfortunately. That's why we don't know how to think anymore. It's like even in, in the hospital. You know, we'll get patients, they get admitted for heart, for chest pain. You know, because everybody's used to, oh, let me do what the computer says. You know, if an order got missed, didn't get put in. You know, it, even though normally it's a common sense thing, okay, yeah, we need to be doing that anyway because the person's in for chest pain. They don't do it. Oh, that order wasn't in. We needed to check another uh, blood level on him. Oh, it's not in there. That should have been a no-brainer, but no one thinks. You know, if the computer doesn't tell us, we don't do it. I mean, just society these days. You know, we've all become. The thing is, you know, we have become the robots. The the the, the robots are thinking with artificial intelligence, and we have become the robots. No more thinking. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps telling us in the Quran, ponder, why don't you ponder? Think about it. He challenges us. He's telling us, don't be robots. Okay. So anyway. So after this, after Maqam Ibrahim, he asked him, he says, did you do the say, you run between Safa and Marwa, and did you ascend Safa? He said, yes. He said, then what did you do then? He said, I recited the takbir, and I made dua to Allah SWT to accept my hajj. And then he asked me, he says, and did the angels recite the takbir with you? And did you have any knowledge of the significance of your takbir? Ya Allahu Akbar. So he says, no. He says, then in reality you did not you know, say the takbir. This reminds me of Bilal, radiallahu You know, when Bilal, when Mecca was conquered, we know his story before Mecca, before uh, Islam. And we also know his story at the beginning of Islam. You know, how he was tortured. So brutally. And yet he did not yield the least bit. So when Mecca is conquered, Rasulullah says, he orders Bilal, and then he says, go on top of the Kaaba, and make the Adan from atop the Kaaba. Kaaba. I mean, he could have told him, just make it right here. He said, no, go on top. To humble these people who just become Muslim, who still have that, that flavor of racism in them. So Bilal then he climbs on top of the Kaaba, and then from the top of the Kaaba, now he starts thinking, he says, you know, normally when I give the Adhan, I face the Kaaba. Which way do I face now? So he says to the Rasulullah Sassam, he says, Ya Rasulullah Sassam, which way do I face? So the Rasulullah Sassam tells him, face me. Which was nothing new for Bilal, because when Bilal, rather any time he would make the Adhan, whenever he would say, whenever, whenever he would say, say, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He would always be looking at the beautiful face of Rasulullah. Which is why later on he, he stopped giving the Adhan because he missed that, that connection. So he gives the Adhan. Quraysh, who had just entered Islam. 
you know, the, the, that day, um, they come to Rasulullah They can't say what they really mean, so they say, look, Ya Rasulullah you know, he can't even say the sheen properly. He would say, Ashadu. You know, for, for multiple reasons. One, in his original language, there is no sheen. The other is, they'd also burn his tongue when he would say, Ahad. So he'd say, Ashadu. So Rasulullah they said, Ya Rasulullah, you can't even say the words right. So Rasulullah tells them, okay, fine. One of you who's really good in the language, you go and give the Adhan. It was Adhan, Asar Adhan. So he gives the one of them really nice voice, perfect pronunciation, he gives the other. Jabril al Islam comes down after a while. Says, Ya Rasulullah. What happened? There's no Adhan. The Rasulullah says, Yes, they gave the Adhan. He said, Ya Rasulullah, we didn't hear it. When Bilal gives it, we hear it. Who gave the Adhan? We didn't hear it. You know, because of Bilal's connection to Rasulullah, his love for Rasulullah, when he would say it, everything in the universe heard him. Because everything in the universe knows Rasulullah, recognizes him, except for men and jinn. And because of that connection Bilal had with, with the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when he'd call the Adhan, the angels were, would respond to his Adhan. And this is what the Shaykh is asking. When you said Takbir, when you said Allahu Akbar, did the angels say Allahu Akbar with you? Just like, you know, when, when the Mu'adhan, he says the Adhan, when he said Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, what does everybody say? They say Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So he says, when, when, he's, when you said the takbir, did they say it with you? He said, no. You didn't say it. Just like that person, when he gave the adhan, what adhan is this? That's what Jibreel was really asking. What kind of adhan is this? When it's not connected to you, as it should be connected to you, Ya Rasulullah. So he told him, he said, nah, you didn't say the takbir. He said, did you descend from, from Safa? He said, yes. He said, then at that moment, did you feel all of, of uh, the uh, evil and the weakness departing from you? And the uh, cleanliness, the, the true cleanliness entering you? He said, no. He said, yeah, you didn't come down from Safa. So did you run between Safa and Marwa? Did you do the Sa'i? He said, yes. He said, and at that time, did you feel yourself running away from everything? Mm -hmm. Running toward your Lord to such an extent that you reached Him to Allah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ And run towards Allah. So if you're running towards Allah, you should reach Him. He said, did you feel that? He said, no. He said, then you didn't run between Safa and Marwa. He said, did you ascend Safa? I mean, did you ascend Marwa? He said, yes. He said, did you perceive? And this is an interesting wording. He said, did you perceive that true calmness and peace descend upon you? And all uncertainty leave. He said, it didn't, you know, the question isn't, did it, did it happen? It's when it happened, did you feel it? Did you notice it? Because the transmitter is transmitting. The receiver is the problem. Did you feel that? You know, and to understand that, you know, simply you look at the story of Bibi Hajra. When she ascends Safa, this is when the voice comes to look at her child, and she looks back, and what does she see? You know, Zamzam flowing from the heels of her son. Where her son has been rubbing the heels on the on on the uh, on, on the sand, Zamzam now is flowing up from that. 
Uh, imagine, you know, a mother who is concerned that her baby is about to die. Now suddenly getting that relief and peace and tranquility when she sees all of this water gushing up. And here her running isn't the running of any mother. She is the mother of that child who is carrying the nur of Rasulullah. <laughs> she is the mother of a prophet and not just any prophet but again the prophet who is carrying the nur of Rasulullah. <laughs> so he's asking, did you feel any of that peace and tranquility descend upon you? He said, no. He said, well, yeah, you really didn't a sense of a marwa. Then he asked the real question. He says, did you, well actually from here he says, he says, did you go to Mina? Did you go, leave for Mina? He said, yes. He says, and while you know, in Mina, did you feel, you know, this overwhelming hope in Allah that has nothing to do with anything that is associated with anything that is evil? You know, because if, you know, you go to Mina before you go to Arafat. So in Mina, there should be that anticipation. You know, when you're anticipating something really, really special and good, he said, did you have that anticipation and that hope? And that hope should not be associated with anything that has anything to do with other than Islam. He said, no. He said, well, you really didn't go to Mina. He said, did you go into Masjid Khayf? In, in Mina, there's Masjid Khayf. Did you enter the Masjid? He said, yes. He says, and while you were there, did you fear the fear of fear of Allah to, that you have never felt before? He said, no. He said, well, you really didn't enter the masjid. Last question, I'm going to end with the question. We'll know that there's not time, so we'll go over the question next week, inshallah. Main question, Arafat. You know, Arafat, as we've said, is the Hajj. All of the other aspects of the Hajj can be made up by sacrifice, by this, by that. If someone misses Arafat, he has to do the Hajj over. And Arafat, there's no special prayer in Arafat. Rasulullah so when he was asked about Arafat and what the Hajj was, he, was, he said simply to stand in Arafat for a moment. So if on the ninth of Zil Hajj, Anyone who comes there and simply stands there for a moment, his hajj is complete. That is the hajj. So he's asking, he said, did you, did you go to Arafat? He said, yes. Arafat means to recognize. So he asked him, he said, did you recognize when you were in Arafat, did you recognize where, why you came to this world? what your purpose is here and where you are to go afterwards and did you recognize the ones who point you in these in this direction you know you talk to philosophers oh you know what's the question why are we here oh you know, why are we here you know, what are we doing here all of that is answered in Arafat. So this was the question. He said, did you recognize what, where you came from? Why are you here? Where are you supposed to go? And then the main, or even more major question, the ones who point you in that direction. Did you recognize the ones who point you in that direction? So I didn't get as far as I thought I would. So inshallah we'll go over this next week. Uh, and uh, but So ponder over this. Think about Arafat, think about what Arafat is, what happened in Arafat, 
And if you can if you can put all the dots together, then you get the answers to the questions. <coughs> so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, help us, and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu <laughs> his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah.